In the last video, we saw the strange behavior of subatomic particles like electrons and photons in the context of the double slit experiment. So in this video, we are going to investigate this a little further and try to understand this behavior a little better. So the way we'll do this, um, under try to understand this behavior better, is by comparing and contrasting the behavior of electrons and photons to the behavior of classical particles, which we'll model as bullets, and waves, which we'll model as water waves. So what we're going to do is we're going to study how the double slit experiment behaves, what's, what's the outcome, when our source is a source of bullets, when it's a source of water waves, and then how does this contrast and compare to what happens as we already saw in the case of subatomic particles. So let's perform the experiment with bullets. So let's assume that our source now is a machine gun. Now we'll assume that this machine gun is somewhat unsteady, so it fires these, the bullets come out in some sort of an arc, so they, they randomly get fired in, in these directions. Okay, what do we assume about bullets? We, we assume that they are indestructible, so, so they never break apart. And so our detector, which might be a box of sand, always detects a whole number of bullets. So, you know, at the end of our collection, you know, of, of the period during which we are detecting, we'll either see zero, one, two, some whole number of bullets. Also, if you put two different detectors at two different places, we never see a bullet arriving simultaneously in both detectors, and this is because of the firing rate of this machine gun. Okay, so now, what do we expect to see? Well, what we see is that if we are looking at the probability of arrival of the bullets as a function of x, we see our curve P1 of x, when only the first hole is, is open, the probability of arrival P2 of x, when only the second hole is open, in this, um, let's, let's think of this as an armor plate with two holes, and then a backstop, some sort of armor plate where, we, where the bullet comes to a, to a rest. And now when both slits are open, both holes are open, the probability of arrival of a bullet at this detector at x is actually the sum of these two curves, p1 of x and p2 of x, just as we'd expect with, with bullets. OK, now let's repeat this experiment with waves. So let's assume that we are looking at water waves. So this is a pond. The source is, is some object that vibrates at a, at a constant rate. Maybe it's even your hand that's making waves as long as you make it very steady. So the waves sort of, they, they start spreading out. They're crests and troughs. And then when they, they encounter this barrier with these two slits, two holes in it, and so the waves sort of start again from here. But now, because the source is equidistant from, the, the, from these two slits, the waves are completely synchronized. The crests and troughs completely match up. And so what we are going to be detecting at this backstop is, is the energy of the wave. And the way we'll detect it is by putting a cork in the water and seeing how it oscillates up and down and calculate its, its energy. So let's call this I as a function of x, the intensity or the energy. And if we plot this out, when only one of the slits is open, we get this function I1 of x for this energy. If only slit 1 is open, I2 of x. If only slit 2 is open. But now, if both slits are open, we see this function I12 of x, the interference pattern. This was exactly the same interference pattern we got in the case of electrons and photons. But here we have a very good explanation for why I12 of x is not equal to I1 of x plus I2 of x. So the reason is that the energy of the wave is really so I of x is proportional to 
the height of the wave at x squared. The energy I of x is proportional to the square of the height of the wave at x. And so what you have is that when both slits are open, the height of the water at x is really the sum of the heights due to the wave from, from the first slit and the height from the, due to the wave from the second slit. So the heights add up, but the energies do not. So you have I12 of x when both slits are open. The energy is H12 of x squared, but this is not equal to H1 of x squared plus H2 of x squared, which was I1 of x and I2 of x. So let's try to intuitively now understand this interference pattern. So what happens to, at, at this midpoint here? So at this midpoint, since it's equi equidistant from the two slits, what happens is that the crest, you know, when, when a crest of a wave arrives from slit one, the corresponding crest of a wave arrives also from, from slit two. And so both these crests are trying to move the water up and the water moves up by the sum of these two, two crests. And so you get a p particularly big wave. And similarly, when a trough arrives from the first slit, the corresponding trough arrives from the, from the second slit. And so you get a particularly big trough. And so the, the water oscillates particularly violently in, in, the, in, this, in the middle. This means that the, that the wave at this point has a lot of energy. By contrast, if you move a little way from the center, so that now the wave from slit 2 has a longer distance to travel than the wave from slit 1. So if you move just the exact amount of distance, where by the time, let's say, the fifth crest is arriving at, at this point from slit 2, already the sixth trough arrives at this point from slit 1. And so the crest is trying to make the water move up, the trough is trying to make it move down, and as a result, the water stays still and stays level. And so you get destructive interference at this point, and the water doesn't move at all, or essentially not at all, and so you get almost no energy in the wave. So you get this, you know, these correspond, you know, and as you move away again to the point where you're exactly a wavelength apart, you know, the, this, this, the distance from slit two is exactly one wavelength more than this distance from slit one, then by the time, let's say, the fifth crest arrives from slit two, the sixth crest from slit one has already arrived, and so you again get constructive interference. So you get this kind of constructive, destructive, constructive interference, and so on, giving you this interference pattern. So now let's go back to the experiment with electrons and photons. What happens here? Well, we have, it's, it looks a little bit like bullets because as we said, electrons and photons, they are, they are transmitted in discrete packets of energy. So they are, they are transmitted more like bullets. They arrive in whole numbers at the detector. And when we close one of the slits, this is the probability of arrival. This is P1 of X, P2 of X, and then we have P12 of x, which is manifestly not equal to P1 of x plus P2 of x. And of course, our, our mystery is how could it be that this packet, you know, this, this discrete packet went through either slit 1 or slit 2 and, and the probabilities did not add up. So the mathematics behind this is very simple. The mathematics is just like that for water waves. So what we say is the probability of seeing the, the electron, let's say, at x is the square of something we called a probability amplitude that it gets to x. So what's this probability amplitude? So what we are saying is, well, there's a certain amp probability amplitude that the photon goes through slit 1 and ends up at x. So we'll call this a1 of x. Now, the 
thing about a probability amplitude is it's allowed to be positive and negative. It's like the height of the water. It's positive or negative. And similarly, there's a probability amplitude A2 of x that the photon went through, sorry, that electron went through slit 2 and ended up at x. Again, A2 of x is either positive or negative. When we try to detect the electron, the probability that we detect it there is the square of the total amplitude of the electron being at x, where the total amplitude is a12 of x, which is a1 of x plus a2 of x. And so once again, we see what we saw in the case of water waves, where p12 of x is a12 of x whole squared, it's the square of this probability amplitude, which is not equal to a1 of x squared plus a2 of x squared, which is, of course, p1 of x and p2 of x. OK, so mathematically, this is just as simple as the case of water waves. What's problematic about this scenario is what do we make of these probability amplitudes, which are positive or negative? What does it mean that the electron has minus 0 0.05 amplitude of going through slit 1 and end ending up at x? How do we make sense of this? And what, what is nature doing behind the scenes to make this happen? You can ask, what's the underlying mechanism? What is it that nature is doing behind the scenes? Well, with quantum mechanics, physicists have, have had to accept that they cannot ask these questions about nature, that this is not a question that we have a satisfactory answer to. So here are a couple of quotes from two famous physicists, uh, Heisenberg, who invented the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and Richard Feynman. So Heisenberg said, if we want to describe what happens in an atomic event, we have to realize that the word happens can only apply to the observation, not to the state of affairs between two observations. So we have to give up on understanding what's happening behind the scenes. And Feynman says, do not keep saying to yourself if you can possibly avoid it, but how can it possibly be like that? Because you will go down the drain into a blind alley from which nobody has yet escaped. Nobody knows how it can be like that.